Welcome to Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church and to New Heights Worship. We are so glad that you're here this morning and worshiping with us. If you are a guest this morning, um, I'll be back at the <clears throat> back of the sanctuary um, after the service, and we have a, a gift for you, a mug with some information about our congregation and the ministries here at Pulaski Heights. Um, our sermon series that we're continuing today is called Wise Up, Spiritual Manual for Navigating the Twists and Turns of an Unpredictable Life. And we're going to be talking about the spiritual virtue and the wisdom of cooling off. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit hot, but this is a little bit of a different type of cooling off. So 
Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, if you would take a moment to fill out your Connect cards with me. Uh, this is really important for us as far as taking attendance, not only for um, those who might be visiting, but also for our members. So we ask everybody to please complete the Connect card. Later in the service, the baskets will come around during the offering time if you'll place uh, your Connect card in that. Not only having filled it out, but make a note of the things that you're interested in, the ministries that you might want to be a part of. They are listed here, and uh, we want to be able to sign you up for those. Um, I want to thank everyone who filled out the gospel-type uh, discipleship assessment. Last Sunday, we did that during worship. And uh, for those of you who may have filled out a form that said Tyler on it, sorry about that. We had a, we had a little, uh, little mess up with that <clears throat> in printing. But I think most of you just scratched it out and put your own answers in it. If you have not filled that out, Kenny is at the back. Would everybody look to the back. Instru instructions. Pastor's giving instructions. Um, <clears throat> Kenny has them for you, and they're at the desk, and they're back here. Please pick one up and return it. Um, by September 1st, if you can, no later than like the 6th. I think that's a Friday. I need those uh, to be able to tell us what our type is here in New Heights so that we have a better understanding of who we are <clears throat> in the community in which we worship. Um, also, T-shirts. We have T-shirts on sale for our missions uh, here at Pulaski Heights for the missions uh, team to disperse in our community. And so um, there's some samples there. It's not an exhaustive um, sampling, but it gives you an idea of the different. There's two different types of uh, full cotton, and then there's a blend as well. So you can feel those and get a, a sense of what they um, are like. And there's a couple of poster boards out there that have all the different colors. You order these directly from the website, and they come shipped to your door. So. You can have up to August 31st to get these done, and then they're gone. So we're not going to keep a bunch of inventory here. It's not going to work like that. This is a one-time thing, but it gives us an opportunity to bear witness to Christ as a community together. Um, our mission statement is love God, love neighbor, and change the world. So having said that, let us now stand as a community of faith and greet one another with the peace of Christ. to remain standing as we join together in song. Let us sing, come. come. Now is the time to
seated. And of the Bibles. If there are any third graders here today who are visiting or are not here in this group, you guys just turn around. We would love you to come forward to receive a Bible as a gift from this church family. And if you don't want to come now, just come find us after the service. Marie, can we get some house lights, please? A little hard to see, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 
We celebrate our third graders receiving their Bibles. We give God thanks for each of them and pray for their continued growth in Christian faith. Will the parents and families of the third graders please stand? Parents and families, will you nurture these children by your teaching and example that they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves to profess their faith openly and to lead a Christian life? I will, I will with, with God's, God's help. help. You may be seated. Congregation, now do you promise continued support to these parents and encouragement to these children as they continue to grow in their Christian faith? We, we do, do with, with God's, God's help. help. Third graders, please come forward to receive your Bible as your name is read. Hutchinson Lee Adam. Aaron Akama Makia. Christopher Allen Glason. Henry Brooks Wolf. Third graders, receive the word of God. Learn its stories and study its words. They tell us that we belong to one another, for we are the people of God. Third graders, we have a response. Try to put your card in your Bible. Congregation, please join in our response with, um, in response to our third graders. We rejoice in this step in your journey with God. We pray God will guide you as you use this holy Bible. Amen. Thanks be to God for this gift. Guys, y'all can be seated, and I'm at this time going to invite our other young Christians to come forward for a time with me here at this step. So it's time for the children to come on. So, And if you want to bring your Bible, that would be a great thing to do. You can bring your Bible, yeah. Awesome. Our Wesley Kids Choir will be starting in, the, in September, so... Um, we're still out for summer, but I hope that y'all will be thinking about that. Some of um, parents and kids. Yeah. How was your first week of school? I know some of you were in school, right? Some of you? Yeah. Was it a hard week? Yes. Was it? What was hard about it? Some of the struggles. A different schedule. Yeah. That can be a challenge, huh? Different schedule, different teachers. Everybody got a new teacher, right? Yeah. Did anybody change schools this year? Yeah, you changed schools. Yeah, so we'll be praying about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've gotten your Bible, and I wanted to show you something that means a lot to me. This is the first Bible that the church ever gave to me when I was even younger than you, actually. And I don't know what they were thinking, because this sucker is heavy. <laughs> um, it's um, interesting, though. It does have a lot of, if you'll look in the back of your Bibles right now, the ones that you have, and you have some maps back there. Did you know that? You have maps of the places where um, Jesus walked, and where the disciples walked, as well as all the prophets, Moses, and the people as they came out of Egypt. Um, you'll see a lot of that. Well, I had a timeline. Here's me. I, later on, I wrote my name in there. Can you see my handwriting? How I wrote on there. You think I was four? You're giving me a lot of credit. I think I was a little bit older than that before I started my writing. But it had pictures in it. And it told what the Bible is and um, how we got our Bible. And you have, some, you have some tools like that in your Bible, okay? I did draw in my Bible some, and that's okay. 
And I want to tell parents that you should encourage your kids to take pens or markers and mark them. These are not things that we put on a shelf to collect dust. These are things that we use. I have so many Bibles. I bet I have 20 or more at least Bibles. And one of them is falling apart. I took it to seminary where I studied to be a pastor. And I marked that like you wouldn't believe. And the back of it's about to fall apart. But I keep it because I can see what I was studying. And I can go back to that and see what I wrote on the sides of the paper, uh, on the sides of the margins and stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah? So, in addition, you shouldn't have just this Bible. And I'm going to encourage parents to look up some Bibles that my boys have enjoyed. There's a Minecraft Bible, parent. And um, you got to be careful and get the one that doesn't have the every single um, scene. Because some of the scenes can be rather violent. <laughs> Either that or you have to kind of go through it and um, talk about it as you're doing it. But my boys have really learned the basic stories using that Bible. They also like another Bible um, called the Lego Bible. Same thing. And those are fun. So they have a lot of pictures, and they help us. And then you can pull this Bible out, your Bible, and then you can read the story about it. And it helps reinforce. Today's very special because you're, you get your Bible. But what's even more special is that you use it is that you actually use it and read it and that your parents read it with you. Parents also, I have a lot of requests from time to time on how do I talk to my child about God. And my, my child is asking me difficult questions and I don't know how to answer them. And the reason that you don't know, sometimes mom and dad don't know, is because maybe they never thought about it in the detail uh, that we sometimes do or they never got an answer that they liked or felt comfortable with. I have a book I want to recommend to you. It has things like, Is God Real? Um, the, the Bible, it talks about the Bible. Where does God live? What does God look like? Does God make miracles? When my pet am hamster Elmo died, did he go to heaven? It has some great stuff in it. It's called, Where Does God Live? So I want to recommend that. You might write that down for parents because parents are always asking me questions about good resources for young people. Well, I hope the rest of this week for you goes well. Okay, should we say a prayer about it? Okay. And then make some sugar. That sounds really fun. Okay, let's pray. God, we thank you for these children. We thank you for these Bibles that they have been presented with that do tell us the stories. Help us to open these books and to use them and to tell the stories together as families, to go over them and explore them like a map that points to you. We thank you so much for your love in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, guys, and I hope you enjoy those Bibles, our graders. And those who haven't got them, you'll get yours soon. It'll be here before you know it. <laughs> Let us pray. Let us pray. Gracious God, at this time of year, we turn our thoughts to schools and ask your blessings on the children, teens, and young adults, as well as the educators at the start of the new school year. Whether there is a pre-K student about to embark on a new educational experience or the seasoned grad student, we pray that this will be a year of learning, growth, and positive experience to prepare them for life. We also pray for those who are afraid to go to school. Bless all families at this time and give them wisdom to make good choices with cool heads and warm hearts. Wash away their fear and pain and fill them with your grace. Loving God, bless those who are sick or discouraged. Give them strength and let them feel your presence in their lives. 
Watch over us as we feel as we face new challenges that often overwhelm us and keep us estranged from you. Calm us, center us, keep reminding us that you, God, are the light in the darkness, that you are the constant in our lives. We lift up these people in the hospital this week. For the for the Lucian Farrell and family and the death of his brother Gregory P. Farrell, and to all those experiencing grief and loss this day. Hospitalized recently, Mary Frances Bell, Eloise Buffet, Janet Clark, Pat Garland, Kay Hollingsworth, Frances Pelton, Rob Stephan, Paula Woolsey, and prayers for all who are ill or recently hospitalized. We rejoice in the birth of Winston Shelby Williams, child of Jenna and Shelby Williams, and grandchild of Susan and John Williams, of Cameron Curtis McCauley, child of Brittany and Christopher McCauley. Calvin Jameson Ellsworth, child of Samantha and Alex Ellsworth, and great-grandchild of Nevada and Ron Copeland, and of Wilkes Corbett Howard, child of Suzanne and Brad Howard. We rejoice in the baptism of Faye McCullum Parker, child of Anne, Elise, and Brad Parker. Dear Lord, Pour out your blessings on our young Christians who received their Bibles today. May the stories of Jesus, Moses, David, Ruth, and Esther have special meaning as they read and study the stories that were first passed down from parents to children many generations ago. And may they pass down the stories to our, their own children in the 21st century. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So this Sunday always holds a special part in my heart because this was the Sunday, the first Sunday that I came to Pulaski Heights as a third grader. And magically, there was a Bible for me, even though my family just showed up, the magic of Cindy Burns. Um, so this day is always something. It's kind of like my PH anniversary, so it's always moving. And I congratulate you, also my little brother, but also you other third graders, to just say, holding this Bible right now, you're kind of probably looking at it going... What, what's the purpose of this? Why do I have this another book? But I want to let you know that the book comes in handy when times are hard, when you don't know what to do, and you just need something. So I just encourage you to hold on to them. Keep them in your room. Keep them. But like um, Reverend Becky said, don't let them become an artifact. Let them be used. So Psalm 69, verse 29 says, I'm hurt and in pain. Give me space for healing in mountain air. Let me shout God's name with a praising song. Let me tell his greatness in a prayer of thanks. For God, this is better than oxen on the altar, far better than blue ribbon bulls. The poor in spirit see and are glad. Oh, you God seekers, take heart. So our prayer today is that we praise you with joy, loving God, for your grace is better than life itself. You have sustained us through the darkness and you bless us with life in this new day. In the shadow of your wings, we sing for joy and bless your holy name. Amen.
Through 25. Do not make friends with a hot tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us join together in a spirit of prayer. Gracious God, either through me or in spite of me, speak the good news that we may all hear it, embrace it, and above all, live it. In the name of Jesus the Christ, the risen one, amen. In the last couple of weeks, um, we've looked um, in our worship at the way in which reverence for God, what the Bible calls the fear of the Lord, leads to radical respect and trust in God. 
Fear of the Lord, remember, isn't fear of punishment or God's wrath when the Bible uses that phrase. Instead, fear of the Lord is the foundation for wisdom. And last week, if you weren't here, we learned that trust in God leads us to the virtue of listening, listening to one another, listening to God speak. And today, our scriptural wisdom invites us to cultivate what the wise sages of Israel would call a cool spirit. Now, more than ever, we may need to cultivate the cool spirit. That's because social media, uh, detached email, and text, these are not always the place where we can learn how to cool down tempers, especially the Twitterverse. Yet some of us out there do actually notice the drawbacks when we speak carelessly. Last week, I saw this Twitter post from an acquaintance who said, I'm kind of a hypocrite when I write on Facebook that we need to be kinder, and then I turn around and am a jerk on Twitter. Not sure how I didn't notice that till today. Anyway, even when I disagree with you, which is many, (laughs) I'm going to work on the Twitter zone, life goals. A few days later, I... I saw another post from the same acquaintance. He'd obviously been struggling with the new life goals, and he had simply repeated a single post with the refrain written over and over like a prayer. Be kind, be kind, be kind, be kind. It just went on and on. I grew up in a family where a lot of our humor revolved around getting the best of one another verbally. Don't tell anyone, but it still does. In that environment, I've sort of learned to hone my bombs, my verbal bombs. When I was younger and among friends, we called this type of jousting a cut down, meaning you could cut down someone a size or two, especially if they needed a correction or a solid reprimand. Confession, confession. That type of low filter, high octane verbal sparring isn't the most utilized tool in the pastoral skill set. (laughs) Although, let's acknowledge Jesus certainly could be curt. Jesus could also be challenging and to the point. His detractors weren't so keen on his ministry to the poor and the sick and the oppressed. And his teachings, his teachings are the way he did it play by the established pecking order, these were not so well accepted either. However, even when Jesus was curt and challenging or abrupt, he wasn't mean-spirited. Instead, we could look at that as the subversive wisdom, and we're going to talk about Jesus' subversive wisdom next week. In his book, Hillbilly Elegy, J.D. Vance talks about growing up in a culture in which difficult encounters or insults or other tense situations might be solved by escalating fights or starting a brawl or brandishing a weapon. (laughs) At least that's how he describes some of his inherited working class Appalachian roots. For example... Even after Vance had made his way through the discipline of the military, Ohio State in three years, and Yale Law, he was driving through Cincinnati with his wife when someone cut him off in traffic. He honked. The guy gave him a certain finger salute. And when both cars stopped in a red light, J.D. unbuckled his seatbelt and opened the car door. He planned to demand an apology and fight the man if necessary. This is the way he learned to solve problems. And then common sense prevailed. He shut the door and stayed in his car. In that moment, you see, there's something that happened. And it was... Deciding to shut that door, a human can choose to utilize the cool spirit 
of self-control. In adopting the cool spirit, we reject the short-term gratification of venting our temper or indulging our appetites to gain the longer-term benefits that restraint brings to individuals and communities. It is an exchange of hot for cool. We all have work to do when it comes to self-restraint because we live in a culture obsessed with beauty, sex, power, addiction, and anything that is supposed to make us feel good. Ever read the book, Affluenza, the All-Consuming Epidemic? The authors define it as a painful, contagious, socially transmitted condition of overload, debt, anxiety, and waste resulting from the dogged pursuit of more. And these desires promoted in our culture on top of the reality that humans get tired, annoyed, and frustrated, that's a, a tinderbox or can be. We become less able to let it roll off and keeping cool, keeping our cool can be a challenge. The work of self-restraint is patience, understanding, and controlling negative impulses. I hate lines. I hate lines, and I hate waiting. I was ticking off the items we'd come to pick up at the specialty store. Going down my list. We were shopping for back-to-school lunch items. We found some really keen recyclable uh, Ziplocs. Never seen those. Wow, this is cool. Great for the environment. Going to be a good example here. We got some new flexible ice bags uh, for the lunch boxes. Really packs more neatly than the hard ones. There were some wonderful small um, containers, well, little bitty containers for dipping sauces. This is cool. I'm thinking I wish I had this when I was a kid. Um, there was just some wonderful um, items we were searching for. And before long, you know, our cart was full. I could feel my kids, even though they're a little older, I could feel them getting tired of this uh, shopping excursion and one sat down <laughs> on the floor, that's always a, a big sign uh, that it's time to go soon. And so we headed to the checkout, and I could see there were not enough clerks, but more people were coming to the checkout. And the only checker was two people ahead of us, and they seemed to be discussing um, with the shopper discounts or return or some other issue. So I, I was thinking, this is going to take too long. This is going to be longer than I want it to be. And the woman in front of me actually didn't have much. She had just a few items. But there was that log jam in front of her, and I, I, I felt it very impatient. And it was hot. I was tired, too. And then another checker arrived on the other side, and she said she'd get the next person. So I'm thinking, oh, cool. And I'm going to turn around with all this huge amount of stuff in my cart. And the woman in front of me turned instead on her heel and quickly went around me to the other side where she could be checked out. I felt my anger kind of rise up. Wait. She only had a few items and she was next. That's true. But I, I had this whole cart and I had four kids. Excuse me, I only had three. She didn't know about the fourth one. Cut her some slack. I hadn't been able to turn around quickly and zoom toward that final destination. So now I was tired and frustrated and resentful. I mean, she didn't have kids with her. Can she see? I needed to go first. As I watched her from across the line, I looked at her a little more closely. There's something kind of familiar about her face. And actually, I don't know her, but I recognized her. She had been in prison some years ago, and I remembered that she became an advocate for other inmates and then that she had served as a chaplain. And then quickly, I felt myself cool off. 
and I put my own inconvenience in perspective. I began to think about the situation that was really around me. My kids are going to school. They're going to a pretty good school. My kids had good supplies, really good supplies. They have everything they need for a good school year. They have stuff they don't even really need, like environmentally friendly Ziplocs. Not only that, I would soon be headed to my nice car with great air conditioning, good sound system, to my nice home where there would be plenty of food on the table. Personal restraint and self-discipline are needed most when we are dealing within a community of people, but it's a discipline we can easily forget. I certainly have. This fact is not lost on the sages of Israel. See, this is nothing new. This goes back thousands of years. There are countless proverbs about hotheads, and hotheads in the Bible are fools. They are foolish people. Those who are hot-tempered stir up strife, but those who are slow to anger calm contention. The angry man stirs up strife, but one who is slow to anger heals discord. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. The wisdom literature is full of this advice. The reason there are so many warnings in Proverbs as well as other parts of the Bible's wisdom literature is because the sages understand that the discipline of self-restraint is hard. It's not easy. In Greek, self-control means literally dominion or mastery within. I guess we might say in vernacular today, get a grip on yourself. It is a virtue that one must practice, but not merely for personal use. You see, self-control is also for public benefit. The Apostle Paul calls out behaviors that arise from a lack of restraint. These are, he says, works of the flesh, such as sexual immorality, moral corruption, doing whatever feels good, idolatry, drug use and casting spells, hate, Fighting, obsession, losing your temper, competitive opposition, conflict, selfishness, group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, partying, and the other, and other things like that from Galatians 5. And in that same passage, Paul is clear to say we do not avoid this lack of self-control without help. You can't do it on your own. Remember, this same Paul, the same guy also known as Saul, when we first meet him, helped to murder, to stone Stephen, one of the first apostles. He opposed violently the earliest church, the disciples. He created conflict. He many times lost his temper and exhibited the behavior of what? A fool, a hothead. And yet, and yet, by the time we look at Galatians, Paul can speak about his own transformation, saying the fruit of the Spirit, this comes from God, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the self with its passions and its desires. You learn to put others before yourself in a healthy way. If we all embrace these disciplines, Paul tells us, we can ensure a community in which we are traveling along together on the path of wisdom that leads to shalom or peace, peace with justice. The classic American novel To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee was voted number one in 2018 by the public broadcasting series The Great American Read. Set in Alabama, you may recall, during the Great Depression, the story is told by six-year-old Jean Louise Finch, also known as Scout. As you may recall, Scout's father, Atticus Finch, an attorney, is assigned to defend Tom Robinson, a black man. He is charged with attacking a white woman, Mayella Yule, and Atticus is appointed to defend Mr. Robinson. The all-powerful white citizen 
of the town disapprove of Atticus taking the case. Because of that, other children taunt Scout and her brother Jim for Atticus's actions and call him racial epithets. Scout, remember as a character, Scout's what we used to call a tomboy. Scout doesn't like dresses. She's not very conforming to gender roles. And she has no problem fighting to uphold her father's honor, even though he told her not to fight, not to resolve conflict in that way. Atticus, you see in the book, is an exemplar of self-control. He becomes a model of the cool spirit that the sages of Israel define as one who spares words is knowledgeable, one who is cool in spirit has understanding. During the trial, Atticus establishes that Mayella and her father Bob, the abusive town drunk, have lied about the attack. But remember, Tom Robinson is nonetheless convicted by an all-white jury. When Atticus takes Jim out to talk to the Robinsons' home about an appeal for uh, Mr. Robinson, Bob Ewell shows up to menace the family, as well as Atticus. Let's watch. An anonymous sage once said, Discipline puts back in its place that something in us which should serve but wants to rule. When we are unable to restrain our talk and our behavior, as we see so often in this culture, we disrupt the harmony of interpersonal relationships as well as the fabric of a cohesive, caring society. Brothers and sisters, all of us must ask ourselves, how does my lack of self-control hurt others? Have we realized when we couldn't rein in our destructive impulses alone? How are we called to be a cool spirit in everyday life when things get heated? How might we let the teachings of Jesus guide us? Remember that Jesus knew Israel's wisdom tradition, and so should we, in those words of that wisdom tradition. Don't befriend people controlled by anger. Don't associate with hot-tempered people. Otherwise, you will learn their ways and become trapped. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Friends, as our ushers prepare to come forward, this is the time in our service where we will give back to God. Um, as the baskets come around, I remind you to place your Connect cards um, in the baskets. Also, if you are interested in giving a little more, we can always do that by text to give um, options, which are available in your bulletin for instructions there. We also have a great opportunity to support our missions ministry by purchasing a t-shirt. And you can do that by ordering online at uh, the bonfire.com slash phumc. Or you can place your order out um, uh, in the outside the hall over here um, at our welcome table. And um, there uh, you can see the examples of t-shirts that we have and touch them and feel them and uh, kind of get a feel for which one you like. And you can see all the color options out there. And so when you purchase a t-shirt, uh, we get a kickback to our mission fund. And that really, really will help us out there. So let us pray. Loving God, we often think our lives are rich because of the many things we have acquired. But actually, our lives are rich because of the many things we give away or share. When we clothe the naked, shelter the stranger, and visit the sick, help us to put our trust in you, God, and not ourselves. So our gifts will be multiplied. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. matters is today if you are interested in learning more about our church uh, we have a lunch at 12 uh, to 2 and you're most welcome to come 
Um, Reverend Hampton and I will be hosting that today in the uh, room across from the parlor upstairs. Just come and see me if you are interested in attending. Um, next week we'll be talking about speaking out, uh, the virtue of, of wisdom of speaking out, of moral courage. So I um, hope you'll be here for that. And we also have something kind of special for you with music. We have some special guest jazz musicians next week. And so um, we hope that you'll come and, and uh, experience that. It's a little bit of different kind of Sunday music for us. So um, come and join us with that. Um, and our new sermon series coming in September is called Fake Christianity, Heresies That Hurt and Distort Our Faith. So we've got a few things coming up. And for our third graders, I just want to encourage you to read a scripture this week, or I'll tell you the best place to start, adults as well as kids, pick a gospel like Luke and read all the way through it as a story, and you'll find some really cool stuff in there. Receive this blessing. Go forth and love God and your neighbor in all that you do. Bear witness to the love of Jesus Christ so that those who do not know that love will find in each and every one of us most treasured and generous friends in the name of Christ. Amen. Like the sun, so rain beats.